What's up, everybody? This is the Nowhere to Go But Up podcast, and I'm your host, Sean Dustin. So if you look behind me, the studio is just a little bit disheveled. Um, sorry about that, but I needed to get this interview in. Uh, it's one that I was looking forward to. I don't know if I remember telling you guys this, but I signed up for a, a to be on a newsletter for podcastguests.com. And I had a great response uh, from that. And this is one of the first guests or the second guest that I'm having from uh, that uh, sign up. So Stephen Kunis, I hope I said it right. Uh, probably not. Um, he's a uh, his claim to fame is he right now he's producing a TV series for Amazon Prime called Over My Dead Body. And then also what I found so interesting is he did a TEDx talk and it's called, oh, let me go down, 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 down. <sighs> Square one at 60. And this TED talk stood out to me because in a lot of ways, I feel like I'm in the same spot that uh, Stephen was when he's talking and telling his speech about, you know, the time where he, you know, found himself. Uh, down and out. And so I, it really resonated with me and I really wanted to talk to him um, and hear his story and all that. So yeah, when um, we come back from the intro, uh, we'll be talking to Steven. And, but until then, do me a favor. If you're watching on YouTube, go ahead and hit that subscribe button, uh, smash the like, do all the things you need to do. If you're going to catch this on the podcast platforms, which are audio only, uh, go ahead and like, review, do all the things you need to do, uh, rate the show if you can. I, I, that would really be appreciated. Also, to SeanDustin.com, uh, new website. Go on over there. All the places to connect to the show, everything that the show's doing, that I'm doing, it will be over there. Social media, all that stuff. Head over to SeanDustin.com. If you want to advertise on the show, uh, there are rates over there and uh, the tiers, so you can check that out as well. Uh, you can put your logo right where the keep it 100 is behind me and uh you know if you're a book you're an author anything that you're doing your online business uh, go on over there and, and see what we have to offer you in the in for advertising so anyways um give me a second and after this intro we'll get on with the show be right back Sean Dustin spent time in federal and state prison for drug trafficking and fraud. Upon release in 2006, he had nothing but the clothes on his back, a bag of mail, and legal paperwork. In 2010, he kicked a longtime methamphetamine habit and started the long climb back up the ladder of life. This is the Nowhere to Go But Up podcast. <coughs> If you want transparency and authenticity, you're in the right place. This is the Nowhere to Go But Up podcast, and this is Sean Dustin. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hopefully I got the last name wrong. That's right. The whole thing I went was talking, I was like, oh, I hope I got his last name right. It is Stephen Kunis. It's like Mila Kunis. Okay. In fact, my, in fact, my father is convinced that we're distantly related because we both came or you know, our ancestors came from the same small town in Russia. So I would be secretly thinking, I hope we aren't <laughs> we aren't related. Well, so we haven't got a shot at her. <laughs> That's, She's a good-looking woman. Well, it would be more than uh, more distant than a first cousin, so I think there's a loophole there. Oh, okay, okay. There's a there's a <laughs> technicality there. Yeah. How are you, man? Good to have I'm, you. Thank you for being um, uh, uh, flexible. We had a little bit of a, a mix-up this morning. My fault. Uh, so um, thank you for uh, being flexible and being able to still make this happen today. So. No, no worries at all. I look forward to being on this show. I think it's like uh, just just the title of the show. That sounds like that, that probably could have been at one point, at least on my headstone. <laughs> but fortunately, I don't have a headstone yet. So, 
Yeah. So your TED talk, that's what really I was, you know, I read your, your bio that you sent me, but then you sent me the link to the TED talk and I was like, okay, cause I've watched a few and I've reached out immediately after watching some TED talks from some other folks and had them on the show. So I was like, all right, I got to check this out. And what, what struck me was, is that you were just sort of floating around, like just didn't know like what your next, the next move was going to be right. You're like in stasis. And I mean, how many people get to that spot? Right. And, and how do you get through that spot? I mean, I think that's the, the essence of nowhere to go, but up, right. You're just, you, you're out of excuses. You're out of everything. So tell me about that. Well, what I found was that, you know, getting, getting uh, somewhere going up or going down in my case it was going down uh is an incremental process it's not something like one day something happens and all of a sudden you're at the bottom it, it's 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 kind of like you adjust to a lower and lower level uh f- for instance uh i got divorced you know then then i had to sell my house you know, then I'm in a, I'm a television writer. And so uh, at one point we went on the, the writer's guild went on strike uh, for eight months, you, you know, and then you, you just add, you add to that and you, then, then you can throw in the drinking, you know, you find yourself in a, because that's the responsible thing to do when you have a hundred bucks to your name is to go to a bar and, and consider, you know, what your options are from there, you know? So I did that. And then, uh, discovered Xanax. I didn't really have a drug problem. I was, I was my, doc, my doctor said to me, he said, you know, you're, you have a lot of anxiety, which you go, this would probably be good for you. So I'm thinking I, at that point, I should have bought stock in the company because, <laughs> you know, they, I, I was, a, I was a good customer there. Um, then I started t- t- taking um, checks from my old account that had been closed and putting them in to my current account, figuring that, because because you, you have good judgment too when you're drinking and taking Xanax <laughs> and desperate, uh, th- then, it, you know, I figure, well, I need, I need like $4,000. This will pay all my bills, which is not a lot, you know, but, you know, and then, and then I'll somehow get it. Like, like some job will, will happen. And I didn't realize at the time that that was really, you know, the crime that it was. It's not the <laughs> that was illegal. Really not, like not the crime of the century, but the bank is required to file a police report. So when they get about six of those on you, <laughs> you're gonna, you know, and you're in a little town and, and they go like, hmm, you know, this, what's, what's with this guy? Um, so I ended up get, uh, getting in trouble for that. Get, that's putting it mildly. I was sentenced to house arrest because they didn't have enough room in the jail for me because I'm a nonviolent guy with a master's degree. So what do you do with this guy who, you know, wrote like a bunch of TV shows? I used to work on Cheers. I worked on Family Ties. I worked, Norman Lear hired me at the start. You know, I was not by any means a failure uh, in my, not just my career, but in my dreams. That was what I wanted to do with my life. It's just like my dream came true at the age of 26. But by the time I was 50, actually about 40, 45, work dried up, my marriage ended, and just seemed like I I have no other skills. I can't, you know, work on cars. I wish I could. It's like, I I was thinking, gee, I'm like this really educated, well-traveled guy who literally has like no tangible, what can I do that's going to pay you know, to put a roof over my head uh, on on minimum wage. You know, so so I I got desperate. I I I did stupid things. I got sentenced to house arrest. I was be, because the jails in California were so overcrowded. I was they put a an ankle monitor on me. Oh, they just didn't want to be liable for you getting hurt in there. Yeah, you know, they. They, they said I could get extorted, uh, I could get beaten up, and all this. Um, well, anyway, they put an ankle monitor on me, and I said to my lawyer, "What would happen if I took this off?" 
And he said, well, then they'd make you do the rest of your time in, in the county jail, which is eight months. And yeah, it and makes that, for some good stories, though. Well, yeah. And, and, and boy, did I get some. I, I was involved with this woman, like crazy over this woman. And I said, if I'm not going to, it sounds ridiculous when I describe it now, but, but I end up taking the monitor off my uh, leg. And they said, if you take this off, you would also be charged with grand theft because the monitor is worth like 800 bucks or something like that. So I mailed it back to the sheriff's department. Uh, and anyway, they put out a warrant for my arrest. Uh, they eventually arrested me, and I was charged with escape by force or violence. And the reason is, if you cut the plastic band with a pair of scissors off a monitor, which is done, by the way, every day, people do this, um, they said that that's using force. Mm -hmm. So I appealed that, and, and the judges agreed that it was using force, and I am the only published case in the United States, you can look that up, uh, of a person that was charged with escape by force or violence for removing an ankle monitor while on house arrest. <laughs> because of that, uh, I was given an additional two years, and it's a mandatory state prison sentence. So instead of going to county jail for eight months, I ended up serving about 14 months in maximum security state prison in California, first at Wasco. Uh, and then I went to Tehachapi uh, in ADSEG, which administrative segregation, which is all otherwise known as the SHU, secure housing unit. Um, and that really wasn't that bad because you're how, you, you know, they, I, I went from house arrest to maximum security. So I'm, I'm not really housed by myself. But I'm housed with people that like uh, one guy raped a woman, uh, got out on bail and decided to kill her so she couldn't testify against him. So he like kills the victim. So he's like, he's like life without parole. I got another guy that uh, um, it, well, on and on. One, one guy was uh, getting a divorce and he had a child custody thing and he was going to, uh, he was depressed. He parked his car in front of the uh, on the metro link in la and, and the train went off the rails and killed eight people you know so this is like my, my little my little row that wow. that people that i'm talking to and i'm going like what did you do oh I, I took my ankle monitor off while on house arrest if i'll send you the link it's published it's it's what the judges say they describe my background and you know, what i did and wow. so i i get out i get out of this and the, you know, then they're going you know, to put you on parole. Well, I didn't even qualify for parole because they knew what I did. It wasn't violent. So they sent me to the probation department. I was on that for one year. And the guy kept telling me, you have to get them to change this conviction because anybody that reads it is going to think like you like shot a guard. Mm -hmm. You know, anyway, that was the least of my problems. I, that That's all behind me almost 10 years. The, the thing is, that okay now what am i going to get a tv writing job am i going to get like they'll say where have you been a lot of people i worked with retired you know my daughter you know still still isn't talking to me my son is i'm close with my son, I have two kids and i was sitting at on my my 60th birthday with my friend in a restaurant i said what a failure i am and he he told me something. Actually, I found it out that Julia Child did this. She said, if you take the ingredients in a souffle and you put them in in the order they're supposed you mix it up, you get a souffle. But if it falls, if it's damaged, and you stir it up and you put maybe ice cream in it, she says it's still a souffle. It's still the same ingredients, but it doesn't look at all the, not pretty. the same. And he goes... And my friend said this to me, and this was what was in my TED talk. I, he said, that's really the way life is. He said, he said, if I just took my screw ups and put them early on in my life and my successes later, that at the end of the day, the result would be, well, I've done these good things. I've done these bad things. And life is a mixed bag and we're not all good or bad. We, you know, we're a mixture of everything we've done. 
So, you know, to sit there and mope and say, God, I'm a loser. You know, I used to be this, but now. So, and, and you can add to that. Uh, I started doing a show from my years on The Tonight Show. I worked four years uh, there. We had a fantasy wish list of guests, like like dead or alive, that we would want on the show, like Queen Elizabeth, Napoleon, you know. And mm -hmm. and so I, I came up with this concept of interviewing dead people going to cemeteries as a comedy around the, the world, although it's really done in a green screen studio, but it looks great. And we plug a mic into the headstone and we interview the person and we never mention they're dead. We just say, what are you up to now? You know, that kind, that kind of thing. And what I realized is that my crew, which is mostly people around 30 uh, years old, they had never heard of Jackie Gleason. They had never heard of Jack Benny, Groucho Marx, Mae West, Jimmy Durante. They're, they're thir and so I, I realized I'm so worried about, you know, where I am at this station in my life. And the truth of the matter is nobody will ever know who I like, like nobody really cares when you're gone, you're gone. You know, they're, they take down statues now of Abraham Lincoln. Mm -hmm. Like they certainly don't care about me. And, and it, it, I just, you know what I did? And I, I think your, your listeners might appreciate this. I just gave myself a break. Like, like it says in the description of this podcast, you know, I just one day you just decided to change your story. And I just said, you know what? My story is the same, but I'm, re I'm reading it differently. You know, I, I'm not, you know, I, I, I allowed myself to, in to incrementally slide. I didn't kill anybody. You know, I took like $18,000 which I paid back to the bank. I did that. Um, and I ended up, you know, serving time for a, a totally ridiculous crime. I deserve to be punished, but like really maximum security, like what for, for that? Um, yeah, that is a, that, that, that's a twist that I was not expecting. That, that is, yeah, I should have sent you that link, but I, I just, uh, you know, you know, my lawyer said, just say you were on drugs. I'll send you to rehab. I go, but that's the, like, like, why should I add something that I wasn't really doing? Like, like you know, I was doing <laughs> right. Xanax, but not not then. But it's, why, do, why do I make it worse? It's already, you know, bad enough. And, I, you know, I came out of it, and I'm 66 now. And in the last six years, I just decided I'm just going to do, you know, cut my expenses, which obviously I did, and just, you know, do what it is I love. And, and I... You know, I, you know, we've done a number of these episodes on Amazon over my dead body. Uh, a third of it, it's it's become an, not just comedy, but education, because we spend about a third of the, every episode explaining who the people are. Because even though they're Hollywood legends, they obviously people don't, you know, you know, they didn't know Mae West. They know Steve Jobs. They know Richard Nixon and Mark Twain. But. They probably don't know Phyllis Diller. You know, we did Tupac Shakur. They know they know who he is. Um, we, I remember we Phyllis. Just, yeah. No, no I, just, I was going to say I remember Phyllis Diller from uh, from uh, a Scooby Doo episode. That's right. And they did. You know, we just did an episode on Howard Cosell, and then we're going to do Walter Cronkite and Jimmy Stewart next. And uh, anyway, that you know, I just. The, the number one thing you have to do when you find yourself at the bottom, and it's easier said than done, but really it's just like, I didn't get tired. A lot of people get, they go, oh, I just, I hit bottom and I couldn't, that was it. I finally have had enough. Me, I just kind of just, I think because of my age, I just got tired. I just gave up worrying about what people would think. Once I made all the papers, that kind of went out the window. Because, oh yeah, it doesn't help to be a Hollywood screenwriter to get in trouble you know so it's like i have like these these headlines like uh you know writer slash scam artist uh, or, you know hollywood writer turns bad you know that kind of you know, so now i wasn't laughing during the, during what you're telling me i just can relate i did the same shit 
I, I, you know what I mean? I don't know what person that that's been on drugs that has been responsible at one point in time and has had a bank account and knows, you know, the empty envelope routine, right. <laughs> you, you know, it's just, uh, it's so funny. Somebody said there's a, there's a lot of books out there in the world, but the one book that does not exist is called the great cocaine success story. They, they don't, they don't have, that. <laughs> you know, or the, how to, or the how, you know, how to, how to work your way to the top of the corporate ladder on meth. That doesn't happen. Oh no. Yeah, that, no, it does not. I've tried a bunch of ways. Let me tell you, and it, it didn't work any of them had a lot of fun in some instances, but the, the end result was always the same, uh, misery and, and, and loss of freedom. And the fun, and here's another thing. I spent a lot of time, like my, my wife had wanted a divorce and I did not tell my lawyer who was also my friend for 10 months, he said, why didn't you tell me? Like, I, I created this whole facade that everything was okay. I'm married. What's going Like, I went through so much effort because I was embarrassed. You know, I also didn't tell people that I was broke or that I was unemployed because I thought nobody would want to hire me if I wasn't, you know, working on something. And that's very typical, by the way, uh, in Hollywood. He put on this appearance. It's kind of, it's a natural thing. Nobody wants to walk around going, you know, I'm, yeah, I'm broken out of work. <laughs> I'm a loser, so, baby. I'm a loser, Stop yeah. But they all there, kill yeah. Me. <laughs> so, yeah, right now. So, so I, I was asked to do a TED Talk about my show because the theme was education and entertainment. And they, they came across my series and thought, this is like really funny, but I'm learning things I didn't know about these these guests you know these dead guests and would you want to talk about it and i i said i would but i think you might want to know more about me before you like ask me to do a ted talk and <laughs> I, I and i told them i said i i had been in trouble and i i you know just what i said here and that made them want me more and i go really when can i was, like, I was kind of hoping that they would go oh okay i understand but they kept at it and uh, so I do this talk. And then I didn't post it on my social media. I thought, oh, everybody's going to unfriend me, you know. Mm. So I ended up doing that. And people came out of the woodwork and they said, oh, my God, that's kind of like me. I screwed up. They wouldn't say how always, but but mm. like like everybody relates to that. I had one woman just said, this blew me away. Um, this is my story. Uh, you know, maybe not with the prison, but. You know, they, they all like, I'm at the bottom. That's where I'm at now. And I thought, you know, I'm kicking myself. I go, maybe if I had just been authentic. That's what people ago, want. 20 years ago, you know, Lucille Ball said, not We've everybody. She said, Lucille, right. Lucille Ball said, not everybody likes me, but not everybody matters. <laughs> that's what, you know, you know what? I, I'm you know so busy trying to. You know, put on the appearance and and, uh, and 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 be liked and be employed and all that. And I kind of, I put myself into a position where I have no choice but to be authentic because these days people just look you up on the internet. They can find the TED Talk. They can find my all my credits on IMDb. They can find everything I did. They can also find about my arrest. <laughs> you know, and and probably a mugshot. Um, yeah, you know, that's what makes you real. I mean, that's, that's, what makes you, that's what makes you so a real person. I can't, I, I can't spin it anymore, you know? And I'll tell you, it's a great relief not to spin your own life. It's just, you just do the best you can and support other people. And, and uh, you know, it might sound like a dumb lesson, but I don't think, you know, we have a lot of views on the TED Talk, a lot of positive response. And I, I've never gotten this type of positive response on anything I've done. And and all I did was get up and look at the camera, terrified and told the mm -hmm. truth. I was terrified to do that. It's not, yeah. you know. No, I, be, I bet that's a that's a that's a big well, it's a big platform, but it's also you know it's it's kind of intimidating. I would imagine having to get up there and and kind of bury your soul, especially when you know you yourself. You it's not something that you would ever have thought that you would be telling in a in a setting such as that. So I think that so many people are so tired of the 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 
Hollywood facade of, you know, fake or, I mean, even their real, their version of reality TV is not real. Right. You right. know what I mean? It's like, so you guys cannot, you cannot do anything without fucking it up right. and, and putting and putting your, your, whatever the, whatever shit you put into it that, that has nothing to do with, with creativity at all. Um, you know, and, and then, you know, they just don't know how to stay away and the people are, people see that and, you know, the whole, and in the culmination of the whole last, you know, three years of all that bullshit, you know, that we were fed and then, you know, we can, we're not going to get into all of that, but I mean, it's, uh, it's definitely, we just want real people, man. We want real people. We want real stories. We want to hear about things that we go through as regular people. I mean, we have the rulers that are the elites that, that are so far removed from the average everyday person and their struggles and their strives. Right. right. Fuck them. That's what I mean. That's right. like, so, you know, in, in, in so many words, fuck them. Yeah. I don't care that you don't understand where I'm at and I don't understand where you're at and I probably never will, but you definitely will never understand where I'm at. So let me talk to some people that do. Right. That's <laughs> your exactly right i i found that uh and even even with the ted audience i thought oh well they're not gonna you know they seem to be uh well for lack of other you know whatever like hoity-toity like all oh, this uh, uppity you know where you should see some of the, the the names of the talks like you know three ways to do it's always three ways to do something <laughs> So I don't know what it is, but like the seek the three secrets to, to you know, I can't think of an example, but it's always three secrets. Maybe that's not, that's not much of a secret, yeah, you know, or or or, or you know, uh, the recipe some, to ruin your life. <laughs> it's always you know, it, 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 it's it's some obscure topic, and I'm going like, yeah, I, I, where do they come up? You know, come up with all these things. I said, I'm just going to do one that's called square one at 60 like i see that that's that's basically saying your worst nightmare you know square one at 30 is not so bad no no you, you got know, square one at 60 it's like oh my god i could like die soon maybe when i'm at square one but, i've wasted but, i wasted two whole careers yeah but wait <laughs> but but square you know square one when, when you read when you realize you're not at square one you you need very few things and and and, and the things that are good you know, may have happened in the past. That doesn't mean they won't happen again. But it really, it really is quite a relief. People only see themselves where they are for the for the day, and uh, you know the, the that particular day. And they, they, it's hard to see the overall um, accomplishments, you know, and impacts that you've had on people. So yeah. having 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 looked back at it, right? You've had some time. You're you're now successful. You've got you know you're gainfully employed. You have a, a, a you know some place that you need to be or that expects you to to have something turned in that you get paid for at some point, right? Um, what like what was it? I mean, we all have that moment, right? You know, of this or that. But I mean, what what do you think it was that was just holding you back you know what i mean because yeah the xanax but i don't see you as a like a no it wasn't drug addict, you know what it, i mean it, so it, it, what was it i i just threw that in it was that was just one of the little steps but the, th the thing that held me back is i literally couldn't tell anybody oh that, that's not true i did tell a few people where i was in life and that and the the response was not so great now it's fine but then it was maybe I just have a bad luck with the people I told. But so shame, basically shame. It, is really ba good. Basic, basically, what was was the fear of whatever little I did have left would would go. Mm. You know, don't don't tell. Uh, it's kind of like you go on a dating site and everybody puts their or or social media. They put their best foot forward, and what you're doing is everybody's trying to compete with each other's highlight reels. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like, look, you know, I, I sold this or I'm doing that or look at what restaurant I'm in, that, that kind of thing. And uh, I, I think a lot of it may have had to do with my my industry. Mm. You know, Hollywood is just. Uh, uh, there's an unwritten rule, never bad mouth um, anybody's project, no matter how ridiculous it is. So. 
everybody's just smiling at each other and saying how much they love the, the project they're working on, even if they think it's absurd, you know, ridiculous. And um, I, yeah, I just. So go along to get. Yeah, along my, my, get my, I mean, my parents weren't like that. People asked me that what you just asked me. They said, so what do you think? Like, why were you so scared? And I said, well, it, it didn't come from my parents. It didn't come from anyone. No one has been in, in my family has ever been in trouble. Uh, I'm not saying everybody's been so honest, but I'm, I'm you know, it just, uh, you know, it's not like I had a mom or dad that was beating me going, you better, you know, everything's good. You know? Yeah, yeah. And a smile. Don't, it just doesn't hurt. Uh, it wasn't that. It was just, you know, I, I, I was, things were going smoothly. I had this, this intact family and seeing my name on the, the television, you know, almost weekly. And, and the next thing, to, you know, not to have that, I'm going, oh, I just felt like I had, I had nothing. So I just might, might as well just pretend, just, just keep it going, even if it's just in my own mind. Probably other people knew anyway, you know. I mean, is it that is it that much? <clears throat> like, is that hardcore about appearances in in that industry? Hey, it it is. You know, now people do talk more about um, sobriety. You know, being in the in the program, and you know, that's that's kind of uh, that wasn't really the case when I had my downfall. As as my now, it's kind of like you. That's what my lawyer said. He says, "Oh, just say, you know, do the Robert Downey thing. Say that like you're on her badge of honor now." Yeah, now it's like great. Yeah, I went to promises in Malibu. It's all, it's all thirty thousand a week. It's all good, you know. <laughs> Malibu. But, oh, you know what? I've been to Malibu before. I used to. There's a um. I one time I went there. Uh, Jean Pierre, the 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 guy, the Patron guy. Um, John Paul. Oh, JP, yeah. yeah John JP. Paul DeJoria. And where'd you meet him? Taverna Tony's? No, I'm, I, I went to his uh, party at his house for Christmas. Remember, he has a snow oh. party there. Oh, he had he had the snow machine and yeah, yeah. You know, his or daughter's his... his daughter's a drag racer. Did you know that? No, no, no. It was a beautiful, beautiful home. Um, it was uh, because he allows his his employees from uh, Paul Mitchell and and other right. places to come and and come to the party. So. Uh, his uh, accountant is was my ex's mom, so we were able to go. It's, it's a beautiful place, man. He spared no expense in that party. No, he moved. He has since moved to Austin now. Oh well, so. everybody's going to Austin. Jesus, I, I actually thought about man, maybe I should go and put my fifth wheel down there so I can go and you know maybe do some uh, do some open mic nights over at Joe Rogan's uh, you know uh, the comedy club. Well, that's a good idea. Yeah, I, I I don't know why he left Malibu for that. Maybe just got tired of the mudslides. So I, everybody's just. I mean, it's just California in general. I mean, I live here, and you know, I I am in the heart of the beast in Silicon Valley where I was working. You know, dealing with that stuff. You know that that just that mindset. I guess you would say. Um, yeah, I lived in Malibu for thirteen years. You ever see the Rockford Files? That. Mm -hmm old show where he's mm -hmm. on the beach i lived on that beach at paradise cove um, that's, that's actually where that's actually where my life fell apart uh <laughs> <laughs> it's not i got them i got out to malibu and then it slow, started slowly you know slowly going uh uh downhill that's yeah, a beautiful area but it re it really is no, I, don't I mean, all of California that. is beautiful man it's just it just uh, it's the it's the it's the I don't know, man. I guess it just depends on where you're at. I'm I'm someplace where I'm sort of in a rural area. If so, I mean, I can go to the city. I can be there if I need to be. But you know, I'm don't have people around me hardly at all. So you know, and most of the time, I mean, I don't know, man. People suck. <clears throat> right. You know, animals. Anim, animals are awesome. I have a dog, and I love him dearly. And you know, I've got a, a five year old. I started a <laughs> late, late one on that one. But um, yeah, I mean, I'm just enjoying my kids, my dog, and I just try to do these podcasts and get to know people. You know, it, it's funny how how much more connected I am to people virtually than I am, you know, just in the regular day to day. 
Well, I think we all are. And I think that uh, the pandemic, if there is a silver lining in it, it's that we uh, all learned how to use uh, Zoom and StreamYard, not just uh, for ourselves, but when we watch television, you know, a lot of the, even now, a lot of the um, shows are done still with people from their homes. And so we're kind of, we're kind of used to that. And that actually makes the stuff that we can produce uh, fit right in with, with the mainstream. So. Yeah. It really showed that, that especially when you were seeing, (laughs) you were seeing these main legacy uh, media outlets, you know, dropping the ball right. you know on these uh, stream yards and zooms and all this other stuff and i've been doing it for already a year and a half and i'm just going you know what there's really no difference there's none <laughs> it, so you you can't tell the difference but except you know you have the the lower third you know the 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 words on the bottom of the screen and then you have a few people on and they come in they come out mm-hmm. there's no difference between this and watching you know, one of the main uh, news channels. Yeah, the difference is, is you, there's somebody else is doing it in the background. I mean, Jamie's doing it for Joe Rogan. Uh, you know, Jimmy Dore's got, you know, his people that are doing it. I mean, trying to do it without having that is difficult. It, it is. You need a few, at least a, a few people. Yeah. Um, <laughs> to do that, but but I think that that TV has uh, they saved a lot of money, but from the pandemic because. They just said, "Oh, we'll just keep doing the show like, like a Zoom call." Most of them look like like they they're, they're still not back in the studio as much as they were. They're not flying guests in. They just they have a setup in their house. I don't know who does the lighting or you know. Like and that, that and that really depends on who wants to watch anything <laughs> legacy, anyways. I mean, I haven't, I haven't, I was from from tuning out of it, you know, before three years ago. Uh, there's just no, there's nothing that draws me to it. The only thing that, that has, and I, and I broke down for this and, you know, shame on me. Um, but Yellowstone, right. uh, 1883 and 1923. Those okay. are the only three that I, I broke down and said, okay, I'm going to watch. I, I got to do this. Everybody's talking about this and I like Kevin Costner. So let me, let me, let me go ahead and, and watch it. And I was, you know, I was happy that I did, you know, and, I just I and I had no idea from what when watching 1923. I mean, I knew it was brutal back then coming across the plains, right? But I mean, I had no idea like it was that brutal, right? And I had no idea right. that we like like what we really did. Like 1923 goes a little bit deeper into like what we did to the Native Americans after right. after we put them on the reservation, right? Yeah, it, it, you know, as far as, as far as coming across America, I try to focus on that anytime I'm in a small seat on a plane. Mm-hmm. You know, like, oh, it's going to take me five hours to go three thousand miles, and I'm going to complain about like they're just giving us crackers. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like I'm not, a, I don't know, wagon train, uh, you know, getting shot. You know, With arrows flying by. Camp, camp camping out for four months while I make it across the country. You got oh. some crazy Comanche hanging down underneath the neck of his of his uh, of his right. horse, flinging arrows at your ass. <laughs> right, and I think they white they really they really you know watered down the like you said the Indian thing. Everybody think oh they have the reservation and they have lots of casinos and uh, it must be great, but no, not not you know it was it was terrible. Mm -hmm. but i mean you know but we've done that i mean this country has done that to every single immigrant like group of immigrants that have have like migrated here and it's been different ones at different times you know the asians it's kind of like it's kind of like a hazing i i i I equate it to like we're you know it's a fraternity and then and then anybody that comes here gets (laughs) hazed for like 50 years until they got like they paid their dues you know, and they're like their grandchildren are now doctors and lawyers, uh-huh. you know, but but their dad has it like work in a fruit cart and get beaten up and stuff. You know, that's it's like, welcome up. to welcome to America. You know, that's, <laughs> that's but now really, we that's we really do we we, we, a, we a writer. We do it re- in reverse now. We can't we can't really take advantage of people as much here. So now we just have everything made in China by kids. You know, like <laughs> like like shoes for ten cents an hour, and if the 
you know, children get hit, run over by a forklift. I can't, I don't have any workman's comp or insurance. It's like, <laughs> right. you're in some other country. And, oh, and, then, and, then, and then we pretend we don't know about it. Like Apple says, oh, this is news to us. We're going to look into this. Like, no, our iPhones are made, you know, I don't know about by kids, but. Yeah, we are we are complicit in a lot of the stuff that that we like to to wag our fingers about. Going, oh, that's so bad. Yeah, <laughs> okay. yeah. So, All right. Well, you know, think about what's so bad and how it got so bad and why it's so bad before you start wagging your finger about it being bad. The same thing. The same thing with with uh, television. You know, I get residuals from shows I've written over the years, and I was in Tahiti once. And I met a woman who was from Australia. So it's an eight hour flight to Tahiti from LA. And it's another eight hours from Tahiti to Australia, Melbourne, where she was from. And she said, What have you worked on? And I said, Oh, I did this Kate. I had just done this Kate and Allie thing, old show. And I, I described it. And she said, I just saw that like a month ago. Uh, what? She's describing the whole plot to me. And I'm thinking to myself, I have never gotten a residual on Kate and Allie from Australia. So I know that they mm. are, they are selling, you know, uh, the, the programming all over the world. And the, you know, the union said you're supposed to get residuals. So I, I have a feeling they make a lot more money because you can't account for it. Um, mm -hmm. Selling things, you know, same thing with books. I think eBooks now. You know, this is morphing into another subject, but I'll just say briefly. I think copyright at this point should just go out the window. It's very hard to. Well, monitor, chat, chat. Mo monitor something, you know. Well, Chat GPT, Google Bard, uh, who's the other? Bing AI. Uh, they're they're going to be outsourcing a lot of stuff through that. I mean, you know what I mean. When when you can have a, a you can have a AI basically create a whole script. All you got to do is just give it inputs. Until it I, to, to write it in the likeness of what you know, you name it, and it can do it. That's crazy. You know, and people are saying, "Oh, this is terrible." I think it's extremely cool. Mm. I, think, I, I mean, I, mean I, I use it to to do my uh, my episodes and my clips, my video clips. Right. I I'll just take my I'll take the uh, the transcript of the clip and i'll run it through and out and ask for titles and hashtags and you know facebook posts and you, know, you name it really? I'll, tweak, I'll tweak it a little bit but for the most part i that's what i use i think that that what, what's really the difference between that and people saying uh, word processing or spell check they used to you know spell check wasn't always perfect they they, they don't always hit the right word you got to go over it but it's a great tool mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. I mean, we just have to make sure we, we just have to make sure we don't depend on it too much because with anything when you you know like a muscle your mind is a muscle and if you're not using your mind you're you know you're depending on some some tool to do most of your heavy lifting for you then you're going to atrophy right. that muscle well that's what that's what happened when pocket calculators came out kids stopped like 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 they can't do the problem without that and then now i don't think they teach handwriting in school anymore not um, some do not cursive we used to do, do all that um i was so proud of my cursive my penmanship i'd be all nice i'm, I'm happy that i learned though I, I still write on a legal pad with a rolling writer and then type it up and as i type it up i'll clean up the language you know uh so it's it's not like a wasted time between writing and typing but it's just it's just another that's part of the process. It's a, it's a, it's another um, pass over what I'm doing, and then I'll print it out. And I have my little routine, and then I'll do the editing, and you know. But I, I think I'm rare. I think most people don't do that anymore. I have a writing question for you, and only because I thought about this, and like I'm so undisciplined. Like, how disciplined do you have to be to be a writer? My here, my view is that, and it's one shared by many writers. Uh, you can't sit there and write ten hours a day. It's not you could, but it's not anything good. You really can do. Even Ernest Hemingway said, uh, you know, three hours, three hours of really good focused stuff. You know, he, you know, it, it is about 
what, what you can do. Joseph Heller, who wrote Catch-22, he said, if I can write a page a day, he goes, guess what? 365 pages in a year, that's a book. And he goes, if somebody said to you in January 1st that by the end of the year, would you be happy having finished the book? You go, yeah. It's like, but if you if you break it down daily, it's that's yeah. what it is. <laughs> and I, you know, Kurt, Kurt Vonnegut said, writing a novel is like inflating the Goodyear blimp with a bicycle pump. And it, it just seems like you're getting, <laughs> it seems like you're getting nowhere because you're writing a page or two or a page oh or two. Oh my God. And you're yeah. like, this is like going nowhere. And then you, it's kind of like when you look at trying to lose weight and you look at the scale, you go like, gee, I was just... <laughs> I wish this had like that, like the tenth of a pound increment, maybe. It's just <laughs> like you're getting nowhere. Yeah, yeah. And you have to have. So, is it hard? The hardest part about writing is not writing. You just have you have to do two things. One is I just take the anxiety away and just have faith that if you do it, like just go. You just make a deal with yourself. I do this every day, by the way. I say, well, I'd be happy by the end of this year. If I finish a script and do two episodes, it's like something. I go, yeah, I, I, I would be just thrilled and lost 10 pounds. So throw that in. <laughs> and, you know, and then and then remind myself of the deal. And, and um, you know, the other thing is to write and, and you you do it well as a host of a show. I can see uh, just make sure you don't try to be somebody else. Just use your own voice. Don't go, well, I'm a writer now, so I'm going to describe the clouds and the trees. Like, do you describe clouds and trees like when you talk to people? <laughs> no. It's like, just like, you want somebody to read it without seeing your name and go, that's Sean Dustin. I could totally, I, I like, that. that's what you want. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. don't want them to go, what is, what is this? And that's that's why... I, I think like the AI, it might be hard to get your unique voice. Mm -hmm. It might you might get your point across. So you know, if you if you have enough things that you input, then you know you would you would do that. And, and here's the secret: how to get your own voice. And it's not mine; it's from Kurt Vonnegut. He said uh, he had his sister had died tragically um, early on. Well, after she had kids, and he raised her kids, and he had a picture of his sister. She was in a train accident or something. And he kept it next to his uh, typewriter. And he would look at the picture and he would write his books. And he would pretend that he was telling the story to his sister. He said, you find a person or, or an object, you know, it could be your grandmother, it could be you know, a seashell that meant something to you. It has to be a, something you have a deep emotional connection to. And you pretend you're telling the story like the, what you're writing is being observed by them as well. And he would get the same compliment, you know, over and over from people. They said, your books, I read them and it's, it just feels like you're talking to me. Mm. It would feel like he was talking to the individual reader. And uh, so he, would, he was just, you know, let your guard down, be yourself. And however the language is, is how it is. You're not trying to be Henry James or F. Scott Fitzgerald. You know, Mark Twain said, if, if I have to look, use, uh, somebody said, do you use a thesaurus? And he said, no. He goes, if I have to look up a word I don't know, it's not the word for me. Mm. So he just That's sounded like Mark, Mark Twain, you know, he wrote in this vernacular that was almost like slang. You know, some, some people can get away with writing like Fitzgerald. Um, but, but really it's just, you just, you just kind of sound like who you are mm. and, and, and pretend that you're telling it to somebody that, are, you know, that really means, you know, a lot to you. And, and somehow that will come across, you know, with a universe, universality that, if that's a word, um, universe. A universe, how about universal appeal? There you, People, go. you 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 tell it to one person and you really you know appeal to everybody, and uh, that's what I that's what I try to do. And so do you have any? So when you get into let's say you know writer's block some people you know they come across that do you have any rituals that you do or things that you you know to try to help to prevent that or or if you do end up in writer's block like what do you do 
what, to try to yeah, get yourself what, out of it. What I find that, that works every time is when I'm writing, ideas come to me. I don't, I don't sit there and wait for the idea. Because if I do that, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll have ideas, but but I always something always comes to me when I'm writing. And yet I don't like to start writing unless I have the idea, and which is ironic. But I'll do it anyway. Like I'll just go, you know what? I just I just gotta get this done. You know, if if you're on a salary and a deadline, it's real easy. You just go, I gotta do this. And then you'll wait till the last minute, but you still <laughs> get it done on time because you have to, but, um, I, you know, that's, but I, I really find that always works. I, I start to write. I shouldn't say always, but I mean, most of the time I'll, I'll start to write and I'll go, Oh, I know what I can do. Like, you know, I'll try this. I'll try that. The only thing you have to make sure you do is once you have it, then you kind of make it a little better, you hone it, but you can hone it too much. It's like a statue. They say, like, you get the statue just right, and then you chip away at the ear a little more too much, and then the ear falls off or the nose. Or it, it, you can actually get to a point where you make it worse. Mm. It's it's like if you if you ha have something to say, and you have said it, you might not have said it as well as you would like, maybe, or oh, I could have done this better. But if everybody understands your point, then you've succeeded. So. True. You know, if 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 they read something, oh, I don't understand this at all. Then that's not a that's not a good sign. But uh, that would be my my thought. Also, I I don't know anything about the AI, but I'm f fascinated by what everybody says. It seems like the more detail that you can put into it, mm -hmm. the better that what what comes out. And then you could probably edit it from there and. Yeah, and then you prompt it, and sometimes it doesn't do what you ask it, and so you have to say, "Hey, I didn't ask for this. This is what I wanted." And and then it, you know what I mean. You get into this little, it's it's, and then I I think that the paid version. This is with the I have problems because I'm cheap and I don't want to pay for the paid version, and so me and the me and the free version go go a couple of rounds and you know right. argue with each other <laughs> until it gets me what I want. Uh, but I mean, you know, it's it's just something that's interesting. It helps to it helps to cut cut the time down so i don't have to think too much about it and i just get into a rhythm of you know it's just well you can use it all for, of the legs social media posts right you can use it yeah for that. for that yeah you can do carousel posts you can have it you know actually you can make it you can have it do a script for you for uh you know um something that you want to record uh for social media and it'll tell wow. you what to do, how to, you know, this is a setting, you know, and, and all of it. Um, this, uh, I'm a part of a group called Empowered Podcasting, and they're really into, you know, the chat GPT. And I'm, I'm a part of this group called Next Gen Podcasters, and that's really what they focus on. And it's just about the prompts and, and the inputs, you know, what you, what you give them, the information that you give it and the prompts that you use to have it do what you need it to do. Wow. And was all of this invented mostly in the United States? I have no idea where it's invented, but I know that um, Bill Gates is a part of the was. I think no, Elon Musk was the first one of the first early investors of Chat GPT, and then he pulled out of it because it wasn't. He thought he when he was investing in Open AI, he thought it was open source AI. He didn't realize that they were going to you know charge money for it so i guess he pulled out of it at that point but okay. now bill gates is invested in it um and so his microsoft bing is got a chat gpt um feature to it so he's involved in it which doesn't uh, the, he's never involved in anything good in my opinion but whatever well now now he's saying they should put a freeze on ai for six months there's a thing in the news Wozniak, um, Steve Wozniak, right? Yeah, and 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 Elon, and I think a, a bunch of other uh, people that are in the. Oh space. no, I think I think Bill Gates says it's okay. Well, of course so he does. What, yeah, that's what he, he says. Until he makes fine. his money on it, and then he'll and then he'll shit on it, right? <laughs> like he did the last investment. 
Oh, you should get it. It's the best thing since sliced bread and milk and pasteurized milk and everything else. And then as soon as he made all his money, he dumped his stock. And now, well, now, yeah, he now dumped his stock and, his, and his wife, I think his wife dumped him. And then, and then the, the, uh, think about Bill Gates. He had a lot to say about the coronavirus and how, what the vaccine and how the virus is spread. And I thought, well, he is an expert on that because no one has a, Spreads viruses more than Windows did you know, <laughs> over, the, over the years. <laughs> so one thing they said, like, Matt, you know, if you have an Apple, you're probably not going to get a virus on your computer. I've never heard that. But but they go, oh my god, we've got wind. You know, you always get a Microsoft uh, a virus, the latest thing. So that's a great point. I never thought about. I go, that. Well, he's an, he, he is an expert at that. Maybe maybe he <laughs> maybe he did that so we buy the new the updated system. Well, he just updated it to a new to a new thing that he's invested in, which is the inhaler, the 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 nasal uh, vaccine thing. So, yeah, so I'm I'm not gonna I'm not gonna. He already That's blew. A, it. Another, another he already show, blew yeah. it with the first round. You know what I mean? We already know. We already knew that. You know, you're a, you're a pump and dump kind of guy. Right. <laughs> I think you're right. <laughs> so, Elon Elon Musk. Uh, yeah, I don't know how what he. I don't know. I don't, yeah, I don't I know. Kinda, I kind of like him. He actually has, you know, I might not be popular saying this now, but uh, he really is like wants to give everybody a voice. You don't have to agree with everybody as long as it's not harmful. Like, like you know, you're. But he's a billionaire. You know, you can, I don't care if you say, you know, say say whatever you want. I mean, but I just don't get it. Free speech seems to have been attacked. I never thought it would happen. I used to. I don't know if Don Rickles could do his act today. <clears throat> There's you know? a lot of people that couldn't do their act today. There's a lot of movies that couldn't get made today that were made back in you know the years 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 ago. So I mean, it's completely right. different. I'm not sure how I feel about Elon yet. You know what I mean? I like. He's still a billionaire, and billionaires have classically have been no friend to the working working class ever. Right. Right. You know, so I just, I mean, what's his game? What's his angle? What, what is it that you're trying to do? Is it you want to be like WeChat in, you know, in China or that platform runs everything? It's a financial platform. It's it's like everything it encompasses all. And I think that he has this idea for that for um, Twitter to be sort of the same thing. And like, I don't know what what role him, you know, divulging all that information like what is that like how is that gonna help like what is that like what angle is that gonna serve like do you know what i mean does that make sense right like he's got an angle but what was that angle what was what was exposing our government what is that gonna do for you or what is that gonna do for us was that for us or was that for you <laughs> that's what i'm trying to figure well, I, out I, I think i think it worked for both i mean i, I you know He's trying to. He was trying to tell us this is what's been going on, and it's not. It's not right. You know, the people that that benefited from Twitter um, were all happy about it, but they weren't, wouldn't be happy about it uh, if they were silenced. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, suddenly that would be, be. And this is what I don't understand. I mean, I don't. I don't agree with everybody on every subject, but I. I you have to at least with, hear them I out. Agree with her, I agree with their right to have their opinions, and I don't think any less of them for having. If you told me, like, you know, a person came up to me, I've, I've actually had this happen. I had a person that was that told me years ago, a woman, that she was uh, had been abducted by UFOs. She belongs to an – actually, they have these abductee groups, and she they had implanted a BB or something in her nose. And went on and on and on. And you know what I did? You know, I listened. And she was explaining it in great detail. She was a, the, one of the head story analysts at Warner Brothers. <laughs> it's like she, like a script expert, like she wasn't, you know, living under a bench. And, but this is what, and I said, okay. And, and what do I know? Maybe she is, <laughs> or, you know, I, you know, it's like a friend of mine. Yeah. You yeah. know, I, I'm, I never really, I shouldn't say never, but I, I don't make it a point to, to make fun of anybody who, whatever ideas or beliefs or what do we, what do we know? 
Yeah, you know, it could have happened. I mean, crazier things. Well, now I mean, I've, know, heard, I've heard real, con- con- real stories that have been crazier. Exactly. I mean, Congress have, has a whole committee on UFOs, and they have, uh, and we've seen plenty of them. You know, they have footage of things and the unexplained. They should call it un- unidentified. They're really unexplained. And I'm just using that as an example, but I, I, 20, I, 20 the year of coincidences, right? Yeah, really, <laughs> a lot of a lot of coincidences. Uh, all but right, I, man. We're, we're Stephen. We're we're the hour, man. Um, I, I got to tell you, you're pretty funny. Uh, I can see why you're a writer. Um, and I, you know, I'm gonna. I want to check out some of your stuff. I'm gonna yeah, check I've out. Always, over I, I've always body. had. A, I've always had a. a a sense of humor about things. And that really, I have to say, uh, up until the last couple of years, you know, we've all been able to express whatever thoughts we've had. Now you got to really parse your words. I never thought we'd live to see that, but I don't do it on my show. So watch your time. Say whatever yeah. I want. And you better be careful, man, that, that you're, 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 uh, your your folks down in Hollywood, I'm not gonna like you very much anymore if you if you say the wrong things. Yeah, well, I don't. I just do my show. Stay and that's the way of, to be. That's definitely the, the way to be, you know, stay out of the crosshairs of people. And you know, when you do end up in the crosshairs, and you're usually over the target, uh, and they want to silence you and because they don't have an argument against you. And so it's easier uh, yeah. just to derail and call you names and tell you about how bad of a person you are than to yep. than to to, to give a, a factual uh, argument. So, Hey, I definitely want to thank you for coming on the show. Um, do me a favor, uh, over on the, on the screen, that's where we can find your, uh, your, your TV show over on Amazon is www.overmydeadbody.tv. Right. You can, you can go to, that's the website. And then there are links to the, um, the Amazon link. There's also a podcast link because we take the audio from the, from each episode and they're on all the podcast platforms as well. If if you don't don't have a screen, you can listen to them anyway. You know, I prefer, what do you prefer? Do you prefer listening to podcasts audio only with ear, ear buds, or do you prefer watching, watching them? Wow. Uh, well, if I have my phone with me, I'll I'll watch them. I I, I usually watch them if they're available. Um, I find it. I, I would say like fifty fifty. Yeah, because you're basically just watching a couple of screens, whereas you know listening, you know, adds more to the imagination. It's it's really more uh, a, a radio thing. I think yeah, I like I like listening more with uh, active listening with your ear, earbuds because it's just, to me it's just more of an intimate engagement with the content. Well, you can pay attention. You can pay attention more when you're just focused on one sense. So you got audio. Mm-hmm. If you're if you're, you know, and and you know the funny thing is I'm just surprised how they took off. My my son said, "Why don't you take the audio from your episodes and put it up as a podcast?" I go, "Why?" He goes, more people are listening to podcasts than they're watching television. Mm-hmm. And I'm going, I never thought I'd live to see the day. That, yeah, that, it's, that, and, it's, and it's, and I'm, I think it is a lot better. It is. It's a just get, well, because you can do it. I mean, just, even with the uh, Netflix, you know, the, the, we'll, we'll give you the whole season and you can figure out what you want to do with it. Right. Right. And so this is the same thing. It's, you know, it's a, it's just a, you know, uh, to me, like I said, it's a, I feel more like a fly on the wall of the conversation when it's just me and and the the content in my earbuds and or earphones, whatever you want to call it, and just listening to that conversation. I'm completely engaged in it, and to the point where, like, I listen to Joe Rogan, I can hear him smile. It's crazy. Like I like I know in in like it's just crazy how you can, how you can develop a relationship with, with content and a host and they not even know you exist. <laughs> You're right. And I think that's why he's been so successful. Oh yeah. You know? I love Joe uh, Rogan. So. I do too. He's uh, I, I, I was watching him when I was in prison, uh, fear factor. 
Right. And so that he was, he got me through. He got me through some of the shittiest. Uh, yeah, well, shittiest Joe, Rogan, Joe, Joe Rogan and and Art LeBeau. Let's not forget him. Uh, Art, Art LeBeau. LeBeau. Uh uh-uh. uh. He played Art the, Bell. The, the, the love songs you inmates would call in California. Anyway, they they would call and they would have requests. Oh or, no, or their, I didn't their know wives that. or girlfriends, and he he did that. Oh, uh, that's cool. Show for yeah. many years. Yeah, I'm familiar with uh, Coast to Coast with Art Bell. I listened to him when I was oh, in that, prison, that too. too. Right. <laughs> At midnight or, or 1 o'clock in the morning, whatever it was, because you couldn't sleep because everybody's still banging on the walls, talking, right. making noise. <sighs> That's the one thing people, you know, if, if, they're, if they're listening to this and you're thinking about doing something that could ever land you in prison, just, just for the noise factor alone, don't do it. <laughs> it's no. constant. It's like it's like it's just, what is it like? And I said, oh, it's like putting down a, a lumpy mattress in the middle of a Greyhound terminal. You know, <laughs> it's just like it is so noisy. I swear I lost it half is. my hearing because of that. You know. It is, it is, and then, and then, it, and that's the, and then when you get to like, it gets worse. So it's better when you're in prison, but when you're in like the city jails or county jails, or you're you're fighting your case, waiting to go to prison, that's the worst because they have no respect for anybody that's you sleep or anything. They're not trying to sleep. They, you know, if you if they can't sleep, you they're not going to let you sleep either. Yeah, and the guards, uh, some of them found out what I did for a living. And so they would come and pitch me their ideas for TV shows and movies and stuff. And they were horrible ideas. And I'd have to like listen to it because they could pepper spray me if they wanted to, you know. I just like, Oh my God, that's so funny. I so, get this idea, you know, a couple guys, uh, they break out. It's always that some breakout story, you know, hunting somebody down. So how many people do you come? I mean, this is the last question I'm gonna ask you. So how many people do you come across in your day to day that want to pitch you pitch you garbage? Every single day. Every day. I, I was with this woman like this years ago. We're sitting like some bar, and like she goes, "Wow!" Like like after like five five days in a row of some stranger saying, so, she would go, "Wow!" Like this is like, how do you do that? She goes, "Like thirty years of that," <laughs> and, and and usually it's their life story. It's like I, I don't, I wouldn't mind it if it was like once a week. But it takes over the conversation because then, it, you know, so I, I end up just not saying what I do. Yeah, well, because then it's, not, uh, yeah, the, it, it's uh, now it's an angle. Like like people right. have an angle, like trying now, now I got to work this angle on this guy. You know what right. I mean? How am I going to, how am I going to get my amazing idea in uh, into the conversation? How can I weave, weave this into the conversation and he'll be able to they see always, They always say, like, I said, what would you do to get this story made? I would do absolutely anything. They always say that. I, anything. I said, well, would you take an online writing class? Oh, I don't have time for that. Like, <laughs> no, but you got time to tell me for six hours in a row your story. You know, oh, my you God. People are that. so predictable, aren't they? Right. <laughs> oh my god all right man i gotta get it. you're making me laugh way too much man i enjoyed this thoroughly thank you i i need I have it. had I a great time tomorrow. on this show and uh and you know we're, we're we are certainly uh when it says nowhere to go but up we are certainly far from the bottom here so yeah no no not 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 near anywhere near there anymore mm-hmm. but it's it's just it's just a one bad decision away though it's just one bad decision away. That's all it takes. Yeah, well, I'm gonna tell you if 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 they could if I could like get a patent on uh, shooting myself in the foot, I, I would have made a m- lot of money uh, on that. I, you know, I really perfected that art, but I don't. Do you know that what? Any- I don't do that anymore. So all right. So so one one last thing. I I did. I do relate to you on that level too, because I got a, I got an escape charge once myself, and I so I went out on a pass when I was 16. Um, for for Thanksgiving and decided to go and jump and and not and like disappear like I ran away from my family and went and hung out with the chick and got laid and you know, it was right. irresponsible and everything else and then so I ended up catching a two year uh, wow. suspended sentence as a juvenile for for that sa- that very same thing so you're not alone yeah it's it's very it's it's very yeah, it's stupid but it's very common. It's a com- it's a it's a common mistake, and uh, but but I I haven't heard of anyone that's gone from their you know, serving a sentence in their house to a maximum security you know no. 
Crazy. I've never seen that. That's 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 something. Were you scared? Were you like? Were you were you shitting shitting on yourself, I, thinking you I were going to be put in with it. serious offenders? I, you know, actually, the offenders weren't weren't the problems. You know, I I came to learn that like if you murder somebody, unless you're a serial killer, it's probably like you'll never kill somebody again in your life. It's probably you snapped. You know, you did something really dumb. The gun went off, and there you are. You know, and and so it seemed like the more serious the crime, the nicer the, the people were. Although, though, you know, you wouldn't wouldn't trust them really, as far as yeah. you know, they could. But but you know, I met I met I met some people, a, a good number of people that got really really disproportionate sentences. Like, yeah, they were guilty. Yeah, you know, one one guy. Uh, he was, I don't, I, think, I don't know if he's robbing a house. He did something. Anyway, the cops are after him and he's running away from the cop. Okay. That's his job. He's running away. And the co- and he climbed over a fence and the cop went to climb over the fence to get him. And the cop fell and broke his collarbone. Well, he got charged with assault with great bodily injury on a cop because the guy chasing him, because he made the cop chase him or whatever. Mm-hmm. And the a cop got injured during the chase, broke his collarbone. And the guy got 18 years. That's I'm so going, crazy. You know what? I, you know, I said, you know, I would say three years, five, get, 18 years. Are you kidding me? Like, uh, I mean, I, yes, the guy broke his bone. Yes. He was running. I, all of it. Yes. But eight, another guy gets involved uh, with his, he, he comes home drunk and his girlfriend's bitching at him because he, he, she said, oh, you're with another woman, which he, he actually was. And and, uh, <laughs> and, and, and and she gets into an argument and starts hitting him. And he like headbutts her. Right. She calls the cops. He got 34 years to life because he had had strikes from mm. uh, two strikes from a case. before. And I'm going like and, and I, I he, he was my cellmate. Mm hmm. And, and and I read his, you know, I read like his history because other like, people lie about stuff. Yeah, and, yeah. But I read his appeal, and they they named his entire history and the whole thing. And they said they offered him ten years, and he said ten years for like like she didn't even get a bru. Uh, he was wrong. He was wrong. He was wrong. But yeah, yeah. I go and then thirty four years to life, and and I, I, it was a real eye opener for me to be in a place where I see a lot of. Uh, illiterate people, uh, mm-hmm. people that came from broken homes. They were on the street. They none of them had high school di- diplomas. They're all uh, they were on the street since they were twelve. You know they don't know any better. And they, they were in juvenile hall. They went from there to then they you know, they just like I kind of gradually went down. They gradually went up from from juvenile hall to county to prison to you know, and, and it's a real money making machine. Mm-hmm. And um. Sure is. And it's the real money. It's the number one industry in the state of California is the is the and then the biggest union is the correctional officers union. And yep, they're the there, ones that stand in the way of, of uh, legalization yeah. of, of of psychedelics and legalization right. of marijuana. They were. The I, saw, I, I saw. I saw. I I just still to this day can't believe. Um, what I saw, the people were just, just the, the, some people do, I, you, know, you do something bad, you deserve the, the sentence, but not Mike, I, I, you know, I don't get it. No, it's, I, it's, I, it's rampant and in the federal system too. I had <clears throat> during the pandemic, I interviewed because uh, they were allowed to have free calls from uh, the federal prison, right. During that yeah. period. And so I talked to like 10 different inmates that were currently locked up on what they call ghost dope conspiracy cases which is basically somebody got in trouble and they said oh well i sold to this person and this person has no idea and they just go and round that person up person up and put you in prison because this other criminal said that they sold you drugs and that's all they need and so you think that you're gonna fight the case right because it's like oh there's no drugs there's no evidence how are you going to convict me and they do they end up convicting them and you think you're going to fight the case and you know you they offer you 10 and they and they well that's you know, exactly what happens then... is they they stack the charges they offer mm-hmm. you you know they say you face 30 years and if you take you know eight or something 10 and then they pretend oh we'll lock it to eight and you're going like well this is totally ridiculous i don't mm-hmm. you know 
And then and you've never lawyer, even ever offered me drug diversion once. Nothing. Yeah, and then the, then the, the the lawyer will look at you and say, "It is ridiculous." I'm on. You know, I I totally agree, but I, but you know, I'm not the one. That has, I'm not the one. I'm not the one that goes has to do the time. I, I if I were you, I would really think you'll. And then they try to doubt. Well, oh, they'll let you out in six years. It goes by quicker than you think. But this way, you won't get thirty. And and uh, you almost it's almost like kind of a good cop bad cop thing where they just work together. The they do, they the do, they do. The lawyer and the district attorney. I caught mine actually working together, trying to send me away, and so I right. had no choice but to get a, a paid one. You know, and they just and if you're and if you know if you're educated, oh, that really pisses them off too. If you know your rights, they do not like that at all. Right. <clears throat> Yeah, all right man this has been a great conversation i gotta get out of here because i definitely have to leave in a half hour to go to my appointment so i do right. have to, to to jam but thank you Stephen. i definitely appreciate it hang tight after this because once i i stop the record it needs to pull your local audio from you so i'll we're gonna talk we'll talk for a few minutes while it's doing that uh sounds after. good all right well, thanks I, again I great time here i hope i hope i had a nugget or two of helpful advice for your audience. You did, and you made me laugh, so that's even better. Oh, so perfect <laughs> score. <laughs> Thanks, right. buddy. Thank you. All right, everybody. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Uh, Stephen Coons, he's uh, a funny guy, man. I was not, ex and I was not expecting the twist in that story about him going to prison and having to be in maximum security from. Uh, coming out of uh, house arrest that is absolutely crazy um so anyways yeah uh, i hope you guys enjoyed it uh, i gotta run um keep it 100 stay true to yourself everything else is just noise until next time have a good one you've been listening to the nowhere to go but up podcast sean is a single dad a union blue collar guy and he spent time in federal and state prison for drug trafficking and fraud when he was released from prison in 2006 all he had was the clothes on his back a bag of mail and some paperwork since then he's turned his life around and shares the struggles and successes on this podcast we hope you enjoyed the show and we hope you were moved to connect to the show book a guest spot for merch patreon paypal and social media links go to linktr.ee slash nowhere to go but up on instagram at nowhere to go but up now on twitter at but up now on the youtube channel at nowhere to go but up podcast see you next time